beloved, the preaching topic this afternoon arises out of the 58th Psalm, and I would entitle it, The Doom of Evil People. The Doom of Evil People. And before we hear the psalm read, I would introduce it by saying that Scripture is not an escape from the real world, but rather an expose of it, a bracing expose. This has all the gritty realism of life in this fallen society as perceived by a person with their eyes open to what's really happening. Uh, The Bible tells it like it is, with all its deplorable sinners and injustices. Uh, You know, love and optimism are good things, but they can become uh, something bad if they go to to an unwise place. Uh, Optimism can morph into a naive unwillingness to accept the dark and depressing reality. Um, You may know the term uh, Pollyanna based on an old novel that was popular about a hundred years ago. And uh, she was a girl who manifestly was optimistic even when circumstances seemed terrible. Always saw the good side. Uh, But this can become... um, this can become an unwillingness to face up to the real sin and suffering of this present age. Um, Yet Scripture predicts in this and many places that our miserable, unholy time is only temporary. Uh, To put it positively, the day is coming when the judge of all will rise up and make everything right. We, we, we are the ultimate optimists as Christians because of this hope. Whereas the atheist can't really make sense of things and has no reason to, to think the future is bright, the Christian has God's promise on the matter. And this hope of ultimate justice and a new world where righteousness dwells is critical to our repenting and persevering as God's people. In other words, Psalm 58 is one of the passages God uses to keep us in the faith and in Christ, persevering in in doing the right things when it's hard and unpopular, um, all the way until we we see the, the time when we see the Lord and faith is exchanged for sight. Now, with poetic eloquence most impressive then, Psalm 58 teaches us that as the Lord lives, evil people are doomed. As the Lord lives, evil people are doomed. Hear then what is the word of the Lord, please. Psalm 58, to the chief musician, al Tasketh, mictum of David. Do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do ye judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? Yea, in heart you work wickedness. You weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent, They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. (coughs) Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away, like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. The righteous 
shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a God that judgeth in the earth. Amen. 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 Well, that is so powerful. It almost goes without comment. Uh, but I, I did prepare an exposition, so let me share it with you. Um, I have um, discerned four uh, parts of the psalm, a movement from A to B to C to D. And it seems to me that the parts divide up uh, very satisfactorily uh, between verses 2 and 3, verses uh, 5 and 6, and verses 8 and 9. Those are the three divisions that separate the four parts. And I have uh, indulged a little alliteration here for my outline. The whole, the theme of the whole psalm is the doom of evil people. It's, it's, it's virtually all negative until you get to the end and then there's a positive there's a positive statement that's wonderful indeed but it's still related to the doom of evil people so we have i would say first of all the confrontation of the mighty in verses 1 and 2 then the condemnation of the menace in verses 3 to 5 then a curse for the malignant verses 6 to 8 and finally a celebration of their mortality. Verses 9 to 11. Um, the um, King James translation begins in verse 1 with the statement, Do you indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? And this is a direct, bold, forthright remark made to the guilty in this case, as we shall see. This, this, is, this is prophetic um, accountability for the Lord himself speaking through his prophet to the wicked, as it turns out. The word congregation often connotes the righteous people. Uh, for example, in the first psalm it says that those who, who don't pass the judgment will not stand with the congregation of the righteous. But here... Uh, the congregation of evildoers is in view, a, a phrase that we find in Psalm 26, verse 5. And not just evildoers generally, but this psalm in particular has in view uh, mighty ones, mighty evildoers, even human judges of the land. Um, you could say the people of power in the society and culture, particularly political and judicial power, the power to hear cases in court to condemn and sentence uh, people who stand before them to severe punishment, even to death. So <clears throat> John Gill explains in his commentary, this is about the, the many judges of the land <clears throat> and especially then, Psalm 58 is a denunciation of wicked rulers. Um, and, and our societal structures, of course, today are much different than what they were in the days when the psalm was first written, but it's not hard to make the application. This, this calls to account all, all the wicked political leaders. If, if in any particular generation or time, the president is wicked, this would apply to him. The vice president, the uh, Congress, the Supreme Court, the federal judiciary, the state officials, courts, and so forth. The people who are in places of high authority and responsibility and being ungodly who misuse their power to oppress the innocent righteous ones. Um, so they're addressed here head on. Do you... Speak righteousness, and the intimation is they don't. Do you judge uprightly? 
O ye sons of men. Now sons of men is a Hebrew idiom that stresses the, the, the hearer's human mortality. In other words, they may seem high and mighty and invincible now, but after all, they're, they're weak and they are sure to die. And so they're called sons of men. They have to give an account to the God who made them. So, so what is wrong with these uh, sinners in God's sight? Well, the first two verses lay out the case against them. First of all, they're guilty of unjust speech. Do you speak righteousness and judge uprightly? And the implied answer is no, you don't. You see, they don't speak according to truth, equity, and the standards of God's holy word. Uh, and they don't judge uprightly because they accept bribes and justify the ungodly rich and powerful while they have no um, heart to defend the weak, uh, needy, innocent parties that might show up in their court falsely accused. This is the problem in the main is that they, first of all, that they speak unrighteously and their, their unrighteous speech takes a form of an unrighteous judgment passed upon the innocent in a court of law. Secondly, they're, they're guilty of wicked plans. Notice in verse 2, the translation we, we have read says, Yea, in heart you work wickedness. It's not only a problem with what they say, it's a problem with what they think. Now, when you see heart in Scripture, it doesn't necessarily, in fact, rarely does mean the emotions. It has to do with a person's innermost being, with their thoughts. And here, clearly, it has to do with scheming, with purposes, plans, with intentions. And so this is as much to say, you, you give unjust pronouncements in the court because you're evil in your soul. You mean to do that. You, you're perverse in the way you think. You have evil purposes within. And this is completely consistent with the biblical connection of an evil heart. From an evil heart comes evil words. Jesus said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good words. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil words. Matthew 12, 24 and uh I'm sorry, um, 34 and 35. There may be a tendency in this day not to uh, not to take people's words very seriously and think it doesn't matter what they say as long as what they mean is good. Well, actually in Scripture, there's a strong connection between what people say and the origin of their words, which is their thoughts within. Evil words come from evil hearts. You see their hatred of God in their souls exp exposed by their hatred of men on the outside. We know they hate their fellow human beings because when the ungodly rich stand before them and they justify them, that's flattery. And when the ungodly, uh, when the godly poor stand before them and need defense and they condemn them anyway, that's oppression. It's hatred both ways, whether you're flattering an ungodly person or you're criticizing and condemning a righteous person. A similar passage to this one is found in the 82nd Psalm. Psalm 82, verses 2 to 4. Where the judges, I believe, human judges are referred to as gods. Now, there's a, there's a teaching that has arisen saying that this is referring to actual gods in a divine council, non-human gods, but I reject that interpretation. Look at Psalm 82. How This is verse 2. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? 
Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. This is what the judges, the unholy judges in Israel were failing to do in times of apostasy like this. And Proverbs 17, 15 uh, tells us what God thinks about all that. There it says in God's Word, He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. This is speaking about miscarriages of justice in a court of law. And of course, in our country, this happens all the time. Since we live in an apostate age as well. How unlike our Lord Jesus Christ, these wicked judges are. For the prophet Isaiah described Jesus in, in these terms. And I quote to you from, from uh, Isaiah 11.4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor. And reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. The Lord Jesus Christ is the epitome of the righteous judge. Who, um, who pronounces a just sentence on those who appear before him. So these... Mighty ones, these wicked mighty ones are being censured here in the first two verses for their unjust speech and their wicked plans. And by the way, it's that righteous judge Jesus that ultimately will judge the sinful, depraved human judges. They have to give an account to their judge one day. The the third element of charge in verses 1 and 2 is violent deeds and this is in the end of verse 2 where it says you weigh the violence of your hands in the earth and this seemed a little obscure to me but when I looked into it it seems that this mentioning of weighing something may be associated with the idea of the scales of justice so so Matthew Poole interprets the passage here He intimates that they did great wrong under the pretense and with the formalities of justice. And of course, this is exactly what happened to Jesus himself when he stood before the mighty sinners of this world and he was condemned to death, though he was perfectly righteous. Um, This is a, a censure in this passage of judges who send the innocent ones who come before their courts to unjust punishment. Now, while it is obviously really directed particularly to judges in the world, less powerful sinners do the very same thing in principle, don't they? And so there's a word of judgment against them in this passage too. Whenever sinners who are not the high and mighty in this world, nevertheless refuse to identify with the church of believers when they have no love in their hearts and no desire to help Christians in the world particularly. And in fact, when the name of Christians is mentioned, they slander us, misrepresent us, speak evil against us for Jesus' sake. They are in principle guilty of the very same kind of depravity for which the judges here are condemned and they shall also have punishment from the Lord except they repent. So this is how the psalm opens with a confrontation of the mighty ones. Now in the next three verses, I, I believe there is a condemnation of these people, the very same people as menace. Uh, A menace is a dangerous person or people, uh, dangerous to the welfare of society. So these unjust judges have been um, confronted in the first two verses and now guilty and speechless. They must hear this second part of the psalm too, which is a condemnation. 
And you think about the poetic justice here. The unjust judges would not condemn the guilty as God willed them to do. So since they won't condemn the guilty, they take the side of the guilty against God, the holy judge, then the sinning judges themselves must be condemned because they share in the guilt of the sinners they refuse to condemn. So basically two things are said about these these sinners in verses 3 to 5. Number one, they're evil from birth. And number two, they're dangerous to society. Look at verse 3. The wicked, this is a general reference of the same people who were addressed in verses 1 and 2. Now they're not being addressed directly. The church is being addressed. Here's, here's what's true about them, those unjust judges. The wicked are estranged from the womb They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies, and so forth. The word estranged has an etymology of, of, in English, of being associated with the word stranger. So the implied meaning of verse 3 is the wicked are strangers to God. They're, they're, they're alienated from God uh, from the womb. That is, from the day that they, have, they came out of the womb. And there's no question that's what's in view here because the second line in verse 3 talks about the time. As soon as they are born, that's the day they emerge from the womb of their mothers. So, the... Uh, the, the passage here is uh, variously translated. The JPS Tanakh version of the Old Testament says they are defiant from birth. The ESV says they go astray from birth. The GNT says evildoers go wrong all their lives. All their lives. Um, and this is... This is something that is generally rejected by people. There are not very many people in the world that actually think that anyone is born evil uh, and uh, already a sinner on the day of their birth and speak lies from the day that they're born virtually. Uh, But this is the clear teaching of the Bible. I even found a website this week where a man uh, attempted to twist the sense of this verse 3 in Psalm 58 to deny total depravity, total what he called total hereditary depravity. And uh, he conveniently omitted the part of the verse that said, as soon as they're born, they're speaking lies. Now, I don't think we have to take that in the most crassly literal way because we know newborn infants don't even literally speak with words with their mouths. They're not, they develop language skills later in life. But the point is that they are depraved from the beginning. From the very beginning of their human existence. And this is the very thing Scripture affirms in other places, like Psalm 51 5, where David wrote, In sin my mother conceived me. He didn't mean his mother had sinned, he means that he was conceived in his mother's womb as a sinner from the very beginning of his existence. Ephesians 4.18 basically asserts the same truth in very uh, characteristic New Testament language when it says that of the, of the Gentiles who do, not, um, who do not love God, it says they have the understanding darkened, being alienated, that is estranged, from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And verse 3 uh, mentions that they're speaking lies. And speaking lies is the external evidence and proof of their badness within. As I told you before, there's a link between what one does and what one is. What one says outwardly and what is in one's heart to begin with. First Samuel twenty four thirteen. 
quotes an ancient proverb that is worth uh, remembering when it says, Wicked, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked. I knew the concept, but the exact wording escaped me for a moment. But that is, that is uh, the soul of wit and brevity, isn't it? Wickedness proceeds from the wicked. That is, the quality of wickedness comes out of a person who themselves are wicked. Wicked deeds, evidence of a wicked person. That's the proverb or maxim of the scriptures. So these, these unjust judges are menaces who are evil from birth. They did not start out righteous or neutral, innocent. They started out as sinners from the very beginning of their human existence. And as a consequence of that, they are dangerous to society. Uh, look at verses 4 and 5 where they are compared to, uh, to deadly poisonous snakes. Snakes kill in different ways. Some strangle their victims. But there are some, as we all know, that have, have very dangerous venom in their heads. And when they strike a, 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 a prey, they insert their teeth, which are like needles practically, and inject the venom into the the uh, the prey, which can paralyze them so they can be swallowed whole. Uh, but even some snakes in the world are so poisonous, they can kill a prey which is much bigger than they are, like a human being. I did a little research into this subject, and there have been reports of snakes that are so poisonous, one bite has killed a human being in under an hour. So, Something like that is the, the simile used here in verse 4. Their poison, the poison of these sinners, is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder, that means a serpent, that stops her ear, who will not listen to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely or skillfully. Now this is, this is uh, alluding to um, one of the, I think this is in human writings that we have in our possession today. This is one of the earliest ever historical references to what's called snake charming. Uh, and the Jews would have been familiar with snake charming from Egypt, uh, and there it was associated with idol worship. Now, you, you probably are familiar with this, at least from seeing something on it on television where the cobra is in the basket and rises up out of the basket like this and looks so menacing. And then the Swami with his turban on and the, the instrument that he plays, uh, plays to the snake and the snake seems to be hypnotized and become powerless to bite anyone and hurt anyone because of the enchantment of the snake charmer. Actually, I don't think the snake can even hear the instrument, but the trick of this is allegedly by holding the instrument and moving it about. It, it's the sight of the the instrument that that en enchants the uh, the snake, whatever there is to this. Well, um, here uh, the 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 poet, the sacred poet who wrote the psalm, envisions these judges as very dangerous, poisonous snakes. That are, that are particularly dangerous because even a skilled snake charmer can't disable them. They're, they're, as, as Alec Matier, the late scholar said, they are here portrayed as an inherent, irreformable menace. A, a, a cobra, for example, that cannot be charmed and therefore is a menace wherever it goes. Who wants people like that around? Nobody does. And believe me, they're not going to be around forever. That's part of the hope of the psalm. So, the mighty are confronted in verses 1 and 2. As menaces, they are condemned. 
And then in verses 6 to 8, we come to a particularly challenging part of the psalm and its interpretation, and that is a curse for the malignant. Now here I'm using malignant as another term describing these sinners. The word malignant, the dictionary says, means cruel and likely to cause harm. And so that's a good adjective for these people. Cruel and likely to cause harm. And here the psalmist prays to Jehovah, the God of Israel, that that the Lord would um, disable and dismiss such sinners from human society altogether. And of course, the way ultimately God does this is by killing them and purging them out of the kingdom of God. Uh, in the new creation, they will no longer hurt God's people anymore in the holy mountain, so to speak. But when, when modern Christians read verses like Psalm 58, 6 to 8, some of them get very squeamish um, because this is really a curse prayer. It's called an imprecatory prayer. And it starts out, you know, this way. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break their teeth in their mouth! Does that sound like a spiritually minded person to you? Well, it is. But we have trouble wrapping our minds around how a Christian can righteously pray in this manner. Uh, this raises the subject of imprecatory prayers and passages in Scripture, imprecatory psalms, which is much larger than I can address now. But I did find a brief helpful remark from uh, Willem van Gemeren, who wrote a commentary on the psalms, and he said this, Imprecatory prayer is God's people praying for the Lord's judgment, vengeance, and curse on their enemies. This seems so opposed to the teaching of Jesus Christ that we must ask, how can a Christian read, sing, or pray the imprecatory psalms? And he gives several helpful comments about how it is that we can and should sing psalms like this by faith. But the one that I think is the most helpful is this. He wrote, since evil contrasts in every way with God's nature and God's plan, the psalmist prayed for divine retribution by which God's order would be reestablished. So this is the negative way of praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If your conscience approves of that prayer, it must necessarily approve of this prayer. Break their teeth in their mouth, O God, because this is the same thing in, in substance. This is how the kingdom of God comes. By God judging and punishing and dismissing His enemies in holy justice. Now we have then in verses 6 to 8, 4, very striking similes for disabling the wicked and dismissing them from this world. For killing them and make, taking away their power to hurt anybody. So the first one is this in verse 6. Break their teeth in their mouth. And it says in the King James translation here, Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. So let me put it in the vernacular. This prayer amounts to this. O Lord. Make them toothless lions. Make them toothless lions. Now, one of the most ferocious attributes or qualities of a lion in its prime is the big teeth. And, uh, you know, I've seen film of us lions on the Serengeti, you know, chasing down an antelope and then the poor little thing in comparison finds itself in the mouth of a lion. And when the lion puts those huge, sharp teeth around the neck of an antelope and just bites down, it's, 
it's brutal. It breaks their neck and drains their blood and renders them totally helpless and dead in short order. Well, the prayer then is make them toothless lions. Make them so they can't hurt people like they have been hurting people. Here's a, here's a very vigorous translation I found of the same verse. God, knock the teeth out of their mouths. Lord, tear out the young lion's fangs. And when it mentions young lions here, it doesn't mean lion cubs. It's talking about lions in the prime of their strength. Alec Machir again helpfully explains. So you think of the ferocious lion and the the metaphor or simile here is that the wicked are like those lions with large fangs and claws and and the prayer is take away their ability to devour the innocent prey break their teeth out of their mouth second metaphor or really it's a simile because it uses as Uh, verse 7 remove them like flowing water And this is a little bit obscure. It says in the King James, let them melt away as waters which run continually. Another translation says, may they vanish like water that flows by. And another, may they drain away like water running to waste. Uh, So this is clearly a beautiful image of, again, removal of the unjust judges from God's kingdom. In this world. Uh, And the effect. The real world effect of God removing them. Like flowing water is. uh, In the second part of the verse. When he bends his bow to shoot his arrows. Let let them be as cut in pieces. Or another translation says. When they draw the bow. Let their arrows fall short. That's the NIV. Third simile. This is. Very interesting to me. In verse 8. As a snail which melts. Let every one of them pass away. Now what is this? A snail that melts. Some translations render it as slug. As a slug that melts. Uh, Here's another translation. Uh, This is the ESV. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime. Now, the psalmist evidently was had a first-hand familiarity with either snails or slugs. And he watched one of those little creatures move along, and he noticed they leave a trail of slime. And I think there may have been a popular notion, whether they actually believed this was true or not, I don't know, but a popular notion that the slime really was part of the snail itself. So the idea is if he keeps scooting along long enough, leaving some of himself behind, eventually there's no snail left to leave. And uh, this is the image in the physical creation that is used as a poetic metaphor for what the psalmist is praying will happen to the wicked. That they will just vanish under the judgment of God. And then the fourth metaphor is in verse 8 as well. Let the, Take them away like the stillborn. And there's no, there's no uh, obscurity at all about this. Like the untimely birth of a woman that they may not, be a, be, uh, they may not see the sun. Or the ESV gives it, like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. And this is chilling because this is the first human comparison... And it involves uh, death, obviously. The, 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 the specter of death is raised by the analogy of the stillborn baby. In other words, there's no question what the psalmist is talking about is God rising up in justice to kill the unjust judges and the sinners of this world. And so bless the righteous who are, who are um, left behind to inherit the, the kingdom of God, uh, purged of its enemies. Well, this is uh, very sobering, isn't it? And 
very serious. Psalm 58, I, as I was meditating on it, I thought to myself, it really presents the grand biblical theme of God's glory in salvation through judgment on the wicked. There's a book of that title written by James Hamilton uh, that came out a few years ago. God's glory in salvation through judgment. And uh, Ligonier sells it. I found on the website describing this book, uh, this description. Israel was saved through God's judgment on the Egyptians and the Canaanites. God was glorified through both his judgment and mercy accorded in salvation to Israel. How did God save Israel? Well, when they were slaves in Egypt, God brought them out of Egypt and then killed the Egyptians that would have killed them. How did God save Israel in the days of Joshua? Well, God, in various ways, provided for the extermination of the Canaanites so that the Jews could live there in safety. Uh, the New Testament unfolds the ultimate display of God's glory in justice and mercy as it was God's righteous judgment shown on the cross that brought us salvation. This is profound. What, what Did God show his justice or his mercy when Jesus died on the cross? Both of them. Because that cross was the sight of God's righteous wrath against all the sins of all the elect poured out on Jesus in our place. But that same cross was the most spectacular display of God's mercy in providing uh, a lamb who would take away our sins. God's glory in salvation through judgment. And then this description continues. God's glory in salvation through judgment will be shown at the end of time when Christ returns to judge his enemies and save all who have called upon his name. So that brings us then to the very end of the psalm, the last of four parts, which I'm calling celebration of the mortality. Thank God that mighty sinners who hurt people like, like lions with sharp teeth, thank God they're not immortal. Thank God their day is coming where, where they're going to die and the Lord will sweep them out of the way for his church. So this expresses, these last three verses of Psalm 58 express the hope that our prayers for divine justice and vengeance will finally be answered. And this is worth the most joyful celebration even before it happens. You, you, everybody's familiar with Handel's Messiah. And the, the climax of that piece, which is so famous, of course, is the Hallelujah Chorus. All the words of Handel's Messiah are taken out of the King James Version of the Bible. Do you know that? It's just scripture put to music. And do you know what the context is of that fantastic piece, the Hallelujah Chorus? Hallelujah, for he shall reign forever and ever. You know what the context of this is scripturally? It's the day of judgment. It's the day when Christ returns from heaven to throw down all the haters of God and the haters of man. And that, when, when that happens, the church as one vast body in, in unison offers up the hallelujah to God. See, when the Lord returns, there will be removal of the wicked, there will be revenge on the evildoers, and there will be reward for the righteous. When the end comes, verse 9 is telling us, the judgment will be swift and sweeping. Verse 9, before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. Look, we have here an image 
another image that's used as a metaphor uh, of someone that is about to boil a pot of stew, for example, on an open fire. And they put, to start the fire, you don't start with logs, you start with very small dried branches. Uh, maybe from a thorn bush, for example. So you put the thorns all around underneath the pot, and then you set those on fire, and they start to burn. But it takes a little while before the fire um, from the burning thorns warm the pot even a little. And so this is saying uh, that that before the thorns uh, on fire can warm the pot above them, which is not very long, doesn't take long. And by mentioning thorns warming a pot, we have the metaphor of fire, which is associated in many places of Holy Scripture with divine wrath. So, in this one eloquent statement of verse 9, two ideas are present. That is, the judgment is coming apace, and when it comes, it will take away all the wicked, like a whirlwind is comprehensive in its effects. One of the translations I consulted renders the text, whether the dry thorns are green or burning, he will sweep them away. And then verse 10, and this, this probably is the, the most disturbing verse in the whole psalm for Christians today. It is very harsh, but justly so. It says there will be revenge. Look at verse 10. The righteous, so the, the, this is the church referred to, first of all, Christ is the righteous one, in the, according to the testimony of Scripture, Christ is the righteous one supreme, supremely so. And then the righteous is a label for all those who are in Christ, who are going to be saved, who are not going to be condemned by Christ on Judgment Day. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance, the revenge, that is, payback. And one of the reasons you should believe this is actually going to happen is this is what justice, divine justice requires. God doesn't, in the end, in the final day, when people are sentenced to eternal damnation and cast into hell, they will not be uh, subjected to one ounce more punishment than they deserve in the strict justice of the all-wise holy God. This is, this is just repayment according to justice. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance, which is a recompense for the evil deeds they have done. And then it says, he shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. Look, when the, when the Lord finally rises up as the just judge to pay back the misdeeds of the finally incorrigible Consummate justice shall be done. The church shall be liberated from oppression and the saints will rejoice then. And the image presented here in the second line of verse 10 is of a battlefield slaughter where the Lord himself is the victor and all his enemies are killed. And the slaughter is so vast and so complete that the feet of the victorious army walking across the battlefield are bathed in blood. The, the enemies, the wicked enemies, are all killed, hacked to pieces, and their corpses are strewn about, and the blood is everywhere. But the living are the righteous. The living are the victorious ones. And as they survey the battlefield scene and walk across it, their, their boots get bloody from the blood of their enemies. It's grisly. But this is the blood of the glorious triumph of divine righteousness over the temporal, wicked, power-hungry, 
mighty sinners of this world. And Christ, of course, is the ultimate victorious divine warrior. He conquered our guilt and sin by shedding his own blood on the cross in his first coming. And you know, Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to to condemn the world, but to seek and to save that which was lost. That's true of his first coming. But in his second coming, it's a different story. He's coming with just wrath against all his incorrigible enemies. And he's portrayed differently in the second coming than in the first. Look at Isaiah 63, for example. Isaiah 63, verses 2 to 4. This is the prophet in the Lord's name addressing the Messiah figure, the suffering servant in Isaiah, which is we now know is Jesus. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? When, when they would, when they would uh, prepare grapes and make them wine, the, you know, of course, they jumped around in the wine press upon the grapes. They jumped on the grapes and squished them, squished out the juice. And when this was done the grape juice would splatter up and stain the garments of the workers. And and this is the imagery of Isaiah. But here, it's not grape juice that's red. It's the blood of his enemies. Look, verse 3, I have trodden, the Messiah speaks, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them down in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment or clothing, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And when this is talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus, and when that great day comes, there will be a holy shout and song of praise to God from the from the redeemed of the Lord. It is described in Revelation 19. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are His judgments. For He hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of His servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia! And her smoke, that is the harlot, rose up forever and ever. See, this is the righteous rejoicing when God rises up to take revenge against their enemies. And that is also the day, of course, of the reward of the righteous. Verse 11 of Psalm 58. So that... Now that connects verse 11 to the preceding verse. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the revenge. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked so that a man shall say... Verily, there is a reward for the righteous. He is a God that judges in the earth. In other words, look, let me put it this way for you. While the mighty wicked sinners remain in power in this present age, the superiority of God, the justice of God, and the love of God are not as obvious as they will be on Judgment Day. God is, in effect, hiding himself for now. But on that great day, when Christ returns and justifies all the Christians and assigns eternal punishment to the rest, there will be no doubt left in anyone's mind that it was a very prudent thing in this life and time to serve the Lord Jesus in righteousness. And there will be no doubt in anyone's mind on that day that God really exists 
as the righteous judge of all mankind. And this is a wonderful climax to the psalm. See, God has planned all this from the beginning. And we're reading in the end of the psalm the conclusion of the matter. When, when all of redemptive history comes to an end, people will, will confess, be constrained to confess. There is a reward for the righteous. There really is a God who is the righteous judge. And so, the whole of human history with this cataclysmic end is therefore justified. Because it, it, it's justified as that which God ordained from eternity. Because at the end it will be seen that the conclusion of human history will reveal the glory of God. And praise be to God, it will also include the gracious deliverance of all his elect, his chosen people. Oh, what a psalm this is. What a psalm. Let me read through it again now that we've explained it. Shall we? Listen to this. Do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do ye judge uprightly, O, o ye sons of men? Yea, in heart you work wickedness. You weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are strange from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They're like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bends his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away. Like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a God that judges in the earth. Amen. 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 Let us fear God. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Amen.